Hi, my name's Beth and I'm a programming assistant for the St. Johns County Public Library System. I'm here at the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center located at 102 Martin Luther King Boulevard in the um, historic Lincolnville neighborhood in downtown St. Augustine. Um, this was actually once the Excelsior High School and I'm going to be going inside to meet with Gail Phillips and Kimberlyn Elliott to learn about an upcoming exhibit women who made a difference. It's about five women who lived, um, some of them are still living, um, and worked in the Lincolnville community and what their lives were like. Um, this program is part of St. Johns County's bicentennial anniversary, which St. Johns County Public Library System is celebrating all throughout 2021. Um, we're so happy to learn about all kinds of different um, aspects of St. Johns County history. So let's go ahead and go inside and meet with Miss Phillips and Miss Elliott. Hi, thank you so much for joining me today. Could you both introduce yourselves? Absolutely. I'm Regina Gale Phillips. I'm the Executive Director of Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. And I'm Kimberlyn Elliott. I'm the Associate Director here at the LNCC. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Can you tell me a little bit about this upcoming exhibit, Women Who Made a Difference? Absolutely. We have um, five wonderful, beautiful women who are part of our archives and who are part of uh, Lincolnville history. They all have some kind of affiliation with the Excelsior School. And they are mothers, they're nurses, they're teachers, they're community, community leaders and um, entertainers. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of did a cross um, section of people that's not everybody, but it's the ones we're starting out with. And it started as an art project actually about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. with a, a young Flagler art student who we spoke about, okay, let's brainstorm. We came up with an idea to do the, the um, exhibit. She started on it. She was half done with the pictures. And then we got COVID-19. Mm. And so she graduated. And um, what happened after that? <laughs> it was put on a shelf. That's so we had to pivot to other things, like keeping the museum running during the pandemic and doing more online-based programming and trying to kind of connect with our audience when we were physically separated. But then, a couple months later, the opportunity came back up to revive it, and so we're like, yeah, we did do most of this work already, so let's let's get started. And so it kind of grew and grew and grew from something more smaller and physical to a larger kind of online-based exhibit, and so thankfully uh, we'll be able to have like a physical kiosk inside so people can navigate it inside the museum itself. Wonderful, and then they'd also be able to, to view it from home. Is that... So we're working on it to see how okay. we want to do it. Okay, so, okay. So, so maybe yes, maybe no, but we'll let you know. Right, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll all just have to stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's one of those technical things we're working through. Right. Because it's new for us. It's yeah. the first time that we will actually have an interactive kind of exhibit. Uh, Kimberlyn started doing our first virtual exhibit last year with the Frank Butler um, story. But that was just like, you know, you watch it and when it's over, it's over. This, you'll actually be able to go you know, to different segments of it and, you know, have links to music and photographs mm -hmm. and Definitely. other things from archives, documents, um, uh, newspaper clippings, little oral history clippings, some interesting things. That sounds wonderful. And so this exhibit probably won't be up until at least the summer, is that? Yeah, right? we're looking at June. June, okay. Well, that gives us something all to look forward to, especially as we start to venture more out of our houses. Yeah. Um, could you maybe walk me through a little bit of, of what the exhibit will entail? Well, sure. All right. So while we're in this section, uh, if you'll follow me to my right, your left, this is one of the people that will be featured. And this is, uh, ja this Kate belongs to Jamie uh, Price. So this is more of a, you know, regular normal museum exhibit. So her story will be a part of it, not just, um, you know, um, photographs, but stories about her life, some oral history clippings, her involvement with the civil rights uh, movement, and um, then some of her life, other things that she did as a nurse in our um, county that was very significant in terms of advocating for indigent women who were migrant workers and um, 
We're going to be actually talking with her later. And um, one of the main things in this exhibit, it doesn't focus on one aspect of a person's life in terms of civil rights mm -hmm. or this time period. We are trying to talk about what were they like as women? What kind of impact did they have on the community? Who did they influence? How were they influenced by other people? And actually some of them say like what Ms. Larkin said is also in here. She was a teacher here, so she impacted a lot of people mm -hmm. in the community as a teacher. So, uh, something that I liked, a uh, kind of concept that Gail was talking about when we were talking about the beginning of this project is looking at the women kind of in totality. Um, a lot of the women involved, at least three of them, yeah, Kat Twine, Janie Price, and then Miss Vickers, have like distinct ties to the civil rights movement, um, but just that being one part of their life, and so we didn't want the exhibit to just be known as like a civil rights exhibit. Yes. Obviously, like what they did and the kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, contributions. The contributions <laughs> that they made to the city and to the nation by large are like very important. And so I, I like the fact that even though we didn't start out with this being a civil rights exhibit, the women, like Gail mentioned, Barbara Vickers talks about how the Foot Soldiers Monument is like one of her crowning achievements. It can kind of weave in that idea of like social justice and looking at the things that they did without it being like, this is the one thing that you did and it's all, you, all you're going to talk about for the rest of your life. So like having two of the women still being living, we've been able to kind of ask them more about their other experiences, what it was like being a woman when they were growing up, especially being a black woman and looking at racism and sexism and how they experienced that and all just also just looking at the fun stuff they did in their life. Like what did they enjoy doing? What was it like? Um, so it's been, it's been fun for both of us to kind of sit down and dig through all this stuff. It's so interesting. Can you maybe point out a few of the physical items that are, that are right here in this case? Sure. <laughs> so obviously we have the cake that was behind Kimberlyn and then we have the nurse's cap that um, belonged to Miss Janie. And then, you know, they all, she also was a nurse with the county. Um, so like a, a public health nurse where they went out and these would have been things that they would have used even doing blood pressure cups and you know um stethoscopes um that's just the, you know just typical kind of things that they would have used we also have um you know one of the other women that's in our exhibit is debbie mcdade who um and you can take a look at that before yes. you leave. But we have quite a bit of information about her as a publisher and as a uh, USO tour person. But she also has a very um, interesting life that's been done in a um, play that was performed here at the Lincolnville um, Museum and Cultural Center. And so the women that we have, even though we don't have all the artifacts of their lives, we touch on them in the exhibit, but then tell how just, even with talking with other people in the community, how those people as mothers and as women, you know, matriarchs in the community, how they impacted other people, even people they weren't related to, you know, by just kind of touching them in ways that remind us all of growing up. Well, the older generation <laughs> reminds us of growing up and stories that I've heard all my lifetime, even though I didn't experience all of that myself not that old, but um, <laughs> where, you know, if something happened by the time you got home, you know, your parents knew about it and they were waiting for you when you got yeah. there. So we had <laughs> stories like that that are going to be in there and, you know, just that nurturing community kind of spirit. And it's the same attitude that will cause somebody to go and put their freedom and their life on the line, I think, for civil rights movement because they care about people. And their community. And so this woman right here is Mildred Parsons Mason Larkins. She was a teacher here at Excelsior. Um, she, as we learned through an interview, had kind of like a big, strong personality. She was a big presence in the school, um, somebody to be respected. She also happened to be the mother of Mr. Otis Mason, the first black superintendent here in St. John's County. Um, and so she kind of, we were talking about earlier about Excelsior kind of being a, a common thread throughout the stories as well. So she's kind of like our personification of Excelsior at this time. Um, so yeah, this right here is a Richard Twine portrait done of her in the 1920s. Um, and so if you've been to the museum before, you may have also seen the giant blown up version that we have. because She's kind of the spokeswoman, the face of our Lifeways exhibit that came out in 2019. 
It's a it's a beautiful photograph. Oh yeah. This whole section I love I love Richard Twine's photos. They're yeah. so pretty. Anything you wanna add? No, only thing would be that um you know, she was a single mother during a time when being a single mother wasn't really that popular, you know, that um, she was divorced and remarried. And I think the influence that she had as a teacher, we already talked about, but uh, that, that was uh, one, some of the stories her son, Otis Mason, who was also the founding president of this museum, uh, is that she made sure that they found summer work and, you know, she would drive them all the way to Hastings to go and pick potatoes or cabbage wow. or something. And they also spent summers in New York where their father uh, was some, from time to time. And she had a son who was a Tuskegee Airman as well. And I was in the museum one day and her, um, their family was having a reunion and there was this young lady with a big wide white hat on who looked identical to Mildred and it turns out it's one of her nieces. Oh wow. <laughs> it's one of her brother's uh, children, uh, grandchildren actually. Mm -hmm. And so that family is pretty large. They had a big reunion here for Mr. Mason's 90th birthday. Wow. So we're hoping to share more of those kinds of stories as well. That's, that's really beautiful. So I don't know how much time you have but we do have um, some pictures of Debbie. We have you know Miss Ms. Um, Vickers, who was all over the place. She's been an artist, she's been a civil rights worker, she's been a, a welder, a <laughs> you know, she, um, like a lot of these women, they have varied stories that we've, I found it very fascinating because, you know, she says her grandson, and it turns out her grandson is actually, was inherited from her fifth husband, you know, and they're like, your fifth husband? We didn't know you were married five times. You know? So it's those kinds of stories that really make it really lively and interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to seeing anything you want to show me. Oh, here, okay. you can see her picture. Okay. This is Debbie McDay, the lady with the million dollar smile, and wow. she had that smile until the end. It's like I recognized her in a restaurant because of her smile. Wow. Because this is my favorite picture of her. It's really just a little tiny, from a little tiny handbill is what the photograph is from. Oh, really? So when I saw that, I was just like, wow, this is an awesome picture. I just love the curves. Oh, yeah. You know, I love the attitude mm -hmm. and the smile. It's just like, I know I got it going on and I'm so confident. And that's the confidence, the confidence she took from you know, being a little girl that grew up here and wanted to be a singer and took it to New York City and ended up with people like Louis Armstrong and then some of the other people wow. that she encountered there. That's very cool. Yeah. And so she also went to Excelsior. She went to Excelsior. Mm -hmm. And um, what we did know before is, you know, she had two children. And uh, she had two children early in life. Mm -hmm. and. Um, she didn't rear either one of them. One was reared by a relative and the other one was adopted. And I got to meet both of them um, after the play here in St. Augustine um, from Sweet Emeline. So it was another tragic part of, you know, life that, you know, she was in a time when she was pursuing a dream and, you know, it was, the dream was important to her. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, she ended up coming back later in life to take care of her mother who was ailing. and. She was 98 when she passed away. Wow. She only passed away in 2017. Wow. And and she died here in St. Augustine? In St. Augustine, yeah. She was living in a local nursing home before Hurricane Matthew came and then they relocated her, you know, with the other residents. And she just never thrived after that. I think a lot of people pass away when they have to go through drastic changes like yeah. that. My biggest regret is that I did get to interview her in more in depth. She was scheduled for a oral history interview prior to the storm and the details didn't get worked out in time. And so I ended up going and one of the things she said to me, she's like, I said, Miss Debbie, what you want? You want me to bring you something? You want us to bring you lunch when we come? So she says, you know that little hot dog stand? You <laughs> bring me a hot dog. So I stopped by there and bought her two hot dogs. And then um, the young person who was going to meet me from UF, who was driving over from Gainesville, she had car crawl that oh, day. No. And she had all the uh, recording equipment. So we never got to interview her. Oh. So I really regret that. That's a shame. So the oral history interviews that you've done, do you keep those in the museum? Is that something 
just in your collection or do you actually put them on display ever or well so far we haven't put them on display they become the property of the Samuel Park the oral history program okay. in Gainesville but the agreement that we have with them when we started doing this I think in 2016 is that we get copies of everything that we do so the uh, interviewee gets a copy the Lincolnville Museum gets a copy and University of Florida gets a copy and um, they have a archive which to my understanding we just spoke with Dr. Ortiz last week that they're making it more accessible to the public so they have a whole archive called the Joe Buchanan Black African American Archives through the University of Florida so they will eventually all these interviews that we've done with you know um, Samuel Proctor will be a part of that, but they've got like hundreds of interviews of people from all over the state of Florida that are a part of that. That's really, that's, I just think that's really interesting and it's so important to capture those people when you, when you have the opportunity. Yeah, Definitely. but you know what I learned from that is keep your cell phone charged because mm -hmm. I could have still talked to her that day even though the other person wasn't there, but right. I wasn't, I didn't have that mind, you know, thoughtfulness of mind, but right. just pull yourself on out and start talking. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, so. like this little DIY setup that I've got. I'm yeah. not very professional, it's probably shaky and what have you, but I think this is so fantastic. But the content is there. Yeah, exactly. That's what's really important. My heart is in the right place. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are a few times in life you get a redo, you know, and, and that was one where, you know, you don't think about the person's going to be gone in another few weeks. But she was the same thing with another person in our museum, um, Mr. Chase, because he was in the same um, nursing home she was in, and I snuck across the hall because I asked him, "Mr. William Chase in here?" And she goes, "Yeah, but you did because you have to sign in when you go to the front desk mm -hmm. and everything." So I snuck across across the hall and went and talked to him. And here again, if you see his picture over there with that brilliant smile, I don't know what it is about smiles, but it just gets me every mm -hmm. time, you know. That's true. But um, he was there. He was like. Oh, hi, come on in. <laughs> World War II veterans and, okay. you know, the women who were part of it. She wasn't a soldier, but she was one of those steel workers that worked in shipyards and places during that time that helped to support the war effort by taking on those jobs to make ships and jeeps and all kinds of equipment. That's for our great. Military. How neat. And she was, I mean, she was a bold one, young woman. Yeah. She went to New York and then she went to... Um, Seattle. Seattle, Washington. Oh, wow. And without a job, without, I mean, just were like, okay, I'll find something when I get there. Yeah, I mean, she was able to use, like, the transferable skills that she learned um, while she was in New York. But mm -hmm. before she got to New York, I don't think she had had anything like no. that. But, um, yeah, well, and she was a Rosie the Riveter. I, she probably had a lot of moxie, so. Yeah, <laughs> she still does. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why we enjoyed her so much. She's just like, she's. I would love to have met her when she was younger because oh, yeah. she'd be the kind of person, okay, yeah, let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you both so much for meeting with me. Yeah, and I really look forward to to being able to come visit the museum when the exhibit is up and running. Um, can people visit the museum now? Is it open during COVID? Yes. So we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And um, yeah, you can come on down, wear your mask. And socially distanced, so we'd love to have you. Great, thank you again so much for having me today. Yeah, thank right. you. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. From books about African American history in Florida and specifically in St. Augustine to journals, um, St. John's County Public Library System has all kinds of resources in our collection. Just ask anybody at your local library for help, or you can look online at our catalog, www.sjcpls.org. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I had so much fun and I really learned a lot and I'm so excited to see this exhibit when it's up and running. Um, the museum itself though is stunning and I think that it's definitely well worth a visit even before the exhibit's ready if you have the time to stop by and spend an afternoon. If you have any questions about the Lincolnville community, um, or if you're looking for resources, please just ask anybody at your local library and we hope we see you in the library very soon. Have a great day.